All right, in this video, I'm going to go through <coughs> AQA A-Level Chemistry Paper 3, uh, and this is the 2019 paper. Uh, this is the second half of the paper. I covered the first half in an earlier video. Okay, so the first question is about titrations, question five. Um, the percentage of mass iron in a steel wire is determined by the student. So the student reacts a certain mass of the wire uh, with sulfuric acid to form an Fe2 plus solution. Uh, it makes up the Fe2 plus solution to 100 centimeters cubed, takes out 25 centimeter cubed portions of that and titrates against potassium manganate. <clears throat> okay, now this question, strangely, it doesn't ask you to work out the percentage um, purity from that. Uh, they're more concentrating on the experimental details and so forth rather than the <coughs> actual calculation. Right, the, react the equation for the reaction between iron and sulfuric acid, that's the sort of thing that might throw you because it's kind of a GCSE reaction, really. Um, it gives you iron 2 sulfate, so Fe plus H2SO4. It tells you it gives you iron 2 ions in the question there, obviously. Um, gives you FeSO4 and you get hydrogen gas. Getting that in solution, probably don't need the state symbols. Okay. Um, the titration results are shown in table three. Okay. Calculate the mean titer. And we have to realize here that we only take the concordant titers. So that's within plus or minus 0.1 centimeter cubed of each other. So that means it's just these two. Okay, the other one is outside tolerance. So the average of those two is obviously going to be 22.65 centimeters cubed. Okay, question 5.3. Give the overall equation for the oxidation of Fe2 by manganate ions in acidic conditions. Okay, so we should know this half equation. It's really essential to know this one. MnO4 minus. Uh, when you use it as an oxidizing agent, it gets reduced to Mn2+. Plus. Right, let's balance first for oxygens. So it's going to be 4H2O on the right. Now balance for uh, hydrogens with protons. So that's going to be 8H+, plus on the left. Now balance for charges. Well, we have got um, plus 7 on that side, and we've got a charge of plus 2 on that side. So we're going to need 5 electrons to balance that. Okay, and the other, the other half equation with iron, well, iron will be oxidized to Fe3 plus. This is Fe3 plus. Okay, so it's five electrons in the, well, the first half equation, one electron there, we need to multiply this one by five before we add them together. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just squeeze that in there. So it's gonna be plus five Fe2 plus. And that's going to give us plus 5 Fe3 plus on that side. Uh, get rid of that bit there. So that's that's the equation. Uh, and as I say, you should really know that one because there's always questions on redox titrations with manganate and, and Fe2 plus ions. Okay, state the color change seen at the end point of the titration. Okay, so importantly, manganate is a very dark purple color. Um, <clears throat> most of the other things are much, much, much paler colors. Okay, so when we do the titration, you have got your burette, conical flask here. Right, in the burette, you have your purple manganate solution. The Mn2 plus iron is essentially colorless. It's actually very, very pale pink, but it's almost colorless. Okay, so what happens is as the um, manganate goes into the flask, the purple color disappears. So what you're looking for is once all of this Fe2 plus is being exhausted, the color of the manganate, the purple manganate will persist. So you're looking for a very pale purple color at the end point. The first permanent, very pale purple tinge to the solution. Okay. <laughs> All right, question 5.5. Now the two pieces of apparatus using taking 25 centimeter cube portions of the iron tube is obviously going to be a pipette. 
and adding the manganate solution, well, that's in there. So it's going to be a burette for that one. And finishing this question off with a little bit about percentage error. Okay, the balance used to weigh the 680 milligrams of iron has an uncertainty of that. A container was weighed and its mass was subtracted. Now, there's a bit of a trick there because it's got an uncertainty of 0.5, but we use that twice the balance, one to take the initial the initial uh, mass and one to take the final mass. So we've got to double that. So the error is going to be plus or minus 0 0.01. Okay, 680 milligrams, that is equal to 0.68 grams. So the percentage error uh, is going to be equal to the error, which is 0 0.01 over the mass measured 0.68 multiplied by 100 and that gives us an error of 1.47 percent is the answer there and yeah, don't forget to multiply you <coughs> why you understand you've got to multiply by two because you take two mass readings um, one at the beginning and one at the end Okay, now we're on to the multiple choice section of this paper. Question six is the first question there, the one we've got here. Okay, what amount of sodium hydroxide would react with 7.5 grams of a diprotic acid of MR150? Well, we need to work out the moles of the diprotic acid here, first of all. So the moles of H2A is going to be equal to mass over MR, which is equal to. 7.5 over 150, uh, that's 0.05 moles. Now, <clears throat> this is a diprotic acid. So you, you, if we have H2A, we're going to react that with NaOH. The salt, well, A has got to be, this iron has got to be A2 minus, so it's got to be Na2A. So we need two moles of, of um, sodium hydroxide for every one mole of H2A. So we're going to say the moles of sodium hydroxide we need then are going to be 0 0.05 times 2, which is equal to 0 0.1. OK, now we need to work out how many moles of sodium hydroxide we've got in each of these things here. So we're going to do concentration times volume. So this first one is going to be 0 0.05 multiplied by 50 over 1,000, 0.05, which is going to give us, it's not going to give us 0 0.1, as you can see, so it's not that one. This next one, um, concentration as volume, well, it's going to be 0 0.5 times 100 centimetres. That's not give us 0 0.1 either. <clears throat> C, well, the concentration is point is, sorry, is 1. And the volume is 100 centimeters cubed, which is 0.1. So that one, yeah, that is 0.1. So we have got um, C is the answer. Okay, lead nitrate. Uh, this is question seven. Lead nitrate and potassium iodide react according to the, the following equation. Okay, <clears throat> so that. You can see there that one mole of lead nitrate needs two moles of Ki. <coughs> okay, in an experiment, you have 25 centimeters cubed of 0.1 mole per decimeter cubed of each solution. So in other words, you've got the same moles of lead nitrate as potassium iodide, but we need twice as many moles of Ki as we do lead nitrate. So that means that the um, uh, the Ki is the limiting reagent, okay? Not all, okay? So let's write that down. The Ki is limiting. In other words, the lead nitrate is in excess. Okay, so which uh, which is the what's the amount of lead to iodide formed? Okay, so let's do how many moles of Ki have we got? Concentration 
conk times volume. So that is 0 0.1 times 25 over 1,000. 2.5 times 10 to the minus 3. Okay. Now, all of the Ki is going to react. That's the limiting reagent. Okay. Two moles of Ki are going to give us one mole of lead iodide. So we're going to say they're the moles of lead iodide. It's going to be 2.5 times 10 to the minus 3 over 2, which is 1.25 times 10 to the minus 3. Sorry, not that one. That one there. A is the answer there. So it's important to realize there that the lead nitrate is in excess in that reaction. It's not all going to react. Okay, <coughs> nitrogen dioxide is produced from ammonia in, in these two equations here. What's the enthalpy change for the following reaction? Okay, now we, we, we're going to get that by combining these two equations here. But we have to be careful here because we can see we are making four moles of NO2. So we're making four moles of NO2 there. Whereas in that equation, we're only making two. So what we're going to have to do is we, we before we add these two equations together, you are going to have to double that one. OK, so let's just do that. Add those two, two equations together. We've got to double the bottom one. So we're going to get 4NH3 plus 5O2. And now we've got to add these reagents. So that's doubling it, 4NO and 2O2, that's going to give us these products, 4NO and 6H2O, and <clears throat> we've got to double that plus 4NO2. Now, we cross out anything that appears on both sides of the equation, so that's going to be the 4NOs. Okay, there you go. And that 502 and the 202 that essentially becomes, of course, 702. So let's change that. So, and you can see that that is this equation here. Okay. So if we add this one and add this one, but we've got to multiply it by two as we're doing. Now, what's the enthalpy change of those reactions? To get the enthalpy change for the overall thing, we need to add those together. So it's going to be minus 909 plus 2 times minus 115. That is going to give us an answer of minus 1139 kilojoules per mole, which is D. <coughs> so it's quite an important skill of being able to add two equations together to give an overall equation. Sometimes it's like with that one, you may need to multiply one of them before you add them together. Okay. And this is a fairly straightforward question about uh, Le Chatelier's principle. Okay. What change leads to a higher concentration of SO3? So what's going to push the equilibrium forward? Right. A higher concentration of S of O2. That will, if you, that, that is, the correct answer, because if you add more O2, the Chatelier tells us it's going to try and use it up, giving us more SO3. Let's just check a higher temperature. Well, that will give us a lower yield because look, this is exothermic, this reaction. So a higher temperature would push it backwards. Um, a lower pressure, that would also push it backwards because you've got three gas moles on the left and only two on the right. So a, 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 high, a, high, uh, <clears throat> a lower pressure will push it backwards. Uh, and using a catalyst, of course, doesn't change the position of equilibrium. It just makes it get to equilibrium faster. Um, so that A is the right answer there. Right, 10. Right. Now, <clears throat> the results of an investigation of the reactions P and Q are shown on the table below. Right, they give us the rate equation here. And they give us this table. And we've got to work out the initial concentration of Q. That's missing. Now, there's... There's, there's two ways of doing this. You can, you, you can just look at the rate equation and say, right, you, you double 
P, then the rate's going to double, you double Q, the rate's going to quadruple, and you can do it logically. But that's that's quite hard. If you look at all of these numbers here, there's it's not obvious what's, you know, the they're not it's not like times it's not like uh twice the concentration or anything you know they're, they're all funny numbers there's obviously some square roots going on there or something so i think the safest way of doing this one a bit takes a bit longer is first of all work out use experiment one to work out k okay so let's use experiment one to find k to rearrange k is going to be equal to rate over conch of p, conch of q squared. Let's put the numbers in. So um, the rate of experiment one is 0.4 divided by concentration of p is 0.2 and the concentration of q is 0.5, so it's 0.5 squared. Put those numbers into a calculator. That gives us an answer of... Eight, okay. So K is equal to eight. <coughs> right, so then what we need to do is we need to use experiment two to find out this value, okay? So we need to rearrange the equation again, experiment two. So let's just put Q squared, okay? That's gonna be equal to rate over K times the concentration of P, rate is 0.8, K is eight, and P is 0.6 in experiment two. That gives us a value of uh, 16, 0.167, okay, in decimals. So Q is going to be equal to the square root of that, which is equal to 0.4, O eight, so C is the answer there. <clears throat> uh, a bit of a long way of doing it, perhaps, but probably a safer way. Especially if the numbers didn't seem to be working out particularly easily in that in that equation there. Okay, right. Eleven. The reaction between sulfur dioxide and oxygen is shown below. Okay, in the experiment. <clears throat> two moles of sulfur dioxide are mixed with two moles of oxygen. The total amount of gases at equilibrium is 3.4 moles. What is the mole fraction of sulfur trioxide? Right. The way I do it is to do one of these diagrams. So we've got 2SO2 plus O2. Right. So I would do start moles. I usually do moles used up and equilibrium moles. So let's fill in the numbers there. You've got two of sulfur dioxide and two of oxygen, okay? So two of that, two of that. We haven't got any SO3. Right, now the total amount of the three gases, so, right, we don't know. So let's say that we have used up two X moles of SO2, okay? Now if we've used two X moles of SO2, that means we've used X of O2. And that means we have formed 2x moles of SO3. How many moles of SO2 have we got left over? That's going to be 2 minus 2x. How many moles of O2? That's going to be 2 minus x. x. Um, so now let's do the... Um, uh, we know that when you add all of these up together, the total number of moles is 3.4. So let's just put that in. So we've got... 2 minus 2x plus 2 minus x plus 2x is equal to 3.4. Uh, let's just rearrange that. That gives you 3.4. So that gives you 4 minus x. Hold on there on that side. 4 minus x is equal to 3.4. So x is equal to 0.6. Okay. So x is equal to 0.6. So the moles of SO3, and it's asking to find out the mole fraction at equilibrium. So moles of SO3 is going to be, well, look, we've got 2x, so we've got one, two times 0.6, so that's 1.2. Uh, so the mole fraction 
mole fraction is equal to moles over total moles. So the mole fraction of SO3, so the moles of SO3, that's 1.2, divided by the total moles, which is 3.4. And that is going to give us 0.352. Okay, which I've rounded up. So that's the, obviously the right answer. B is the right answer. Okay. Okay, again, maybe a slightly long winded way, but that's probably a safe way. Okay. Nitrogen reacts with hydrogen in this exothermic reaction. Another equilibrium reaction question. Which change increases the equilibrium yield of ammonia but has no effect on Kp? Now, it's a bit of a trick question. The only thing that changes Kp is a change in temperature. So we can eliminate some here. So uh, no effect. So this one here can't be that because that would change Kp. Right. Let's see what else. Adding a catalyst, would that change the value of Kp? No, it doesn't. It just makes doesn't change the position of equilibrium. So that wouldn't do it. Um, so we've got to see what would give us more ammonia. Which of these two things? Increase the partial pressure of nitrogen. It would, look, because if you've got more nitrogen, that the equilibrium is going to move to the right to try and use up the nitrogen. So that's the answer. Let's just say decrease the total pressure. Let's check that one. Well, decreasing the total pressure, you would get less ammonia because you've got four gas moles on the left and only two on the right. So B is the answer there. Question 13, right, electrode values for two electrodes are shown. What is the EMF of the cell? Okay, so we use E cell is equal to E right minus E left. I don't remember that equation. Uh, so what is the right-hand side equation? It's the copper electrode, so that's plus 0.34 minus, and what's the left-hand? Well, that's minus point minus minus 0.44. So that gives us a value of um, 0.78 plus 0.78. So the answer there is going to be A. Well worth remembering that equation there. Okay, you can't really go wrong if you remember, remember that. You don't have to think either, you just use it. Okay. Now, <clears throat> which atom has the greatest first ionization energy out of that lot there? Okay. Right. Now, very briefly, helium has got the highest first ionization energy of any element in the periodic table. And the reason for that is with helium, if you look here, right, helium and hydrogen, they are going to be, they have got the smallest distance from the nucleus, yeah? And they've got no shielding. So the first ionization energy is very high. Now, why is helium higher than that of hydrogen? Well, because helium has got a bigger nuclear charge than hydrogen, yeah? Right, so that's the, the, the quick way of, <laughs> of doing that question, really. Um, yeah, I've put the little ionization in your graph there. I don't think we're going to talk about it anymore. Uh, lithium is, is, is going to be smaller because you you've got shielding. Lithium is coming from, from two. Neon, again, that's going to have more shielding. That's coming from the second quantum shell. Uh, but anyway, helium is the answer. Right, what is the correct observation when barium metal is added to an excess of water? And I think that's quite important, the excess of water there. What happens with barium metal? Well, Ba, uh, H2O, gives BaOH twice barium hydroxide. Barium hydroxide, if you remember, is pretty soluble, okay? And so that should form a clear solution. It's, it's, if you add loads of barium to a small amount of water, then it would start coming out of solution and it would go cloudy. But look, it says an excess of water. So I think we've got to state, say, presume here that uh, we're not going to get any. Uh, it's going to remain clear. Uh, so what's it going to do? Forms a colour solution only. No, forms a colour solution effervesces. That's right, because you're making hydrogen gas. 
um, and it won't form a white precipitate if you've got lots of water. Okay, so C and D are both wrong there. Uh, 16. Okay, an aqueous solution of a salt. This one, this one had me confused for a minute, actually, this one. I'll tell you why, because the way it's worded. Uh, gives a white precipitate when mixed with aqueous silver nitrate and when mixed with dilute sulfuric acid. Okay, now, uh, I think it's the when mixed bit, because I thought, all right, well, first of all, a white precipitate will mix with silver nitrate. That means it's got to be a chloride, hasn't it? Because Ag plus and chloride ions are going to give you a white precipitate. Uh, so it could be that one or that one. Okay, and that's the second bit here. But, but it also gives a white precipitate when you mix it with dilute sulfuric acid. Okay, now the only one of those two, when you mix it with dilute sulfuric acid alone, that would give you white precipitate would be the barium. Okay, because Ba2 plus ions react with sulfate ions to form insoluble barium sulfate. Okay, uh, I kind of misread the question. I thought, I first of all read it as, which one gives you white precipitate when mixed with aqueous silver nitrate and sulfuric acid, both at the same time, right? That's what I thought it meant, like you've acidified it. And of course, A and C would both do that. But reading the question properly, then it must be A. Which statement is not correct about the trends and properties of the hydrogen halides, okay? The boiling points decrease. They don't, they actually get higher from HCl to HI. And that's because the van der Waals forces must get bigger because the, the iodine atom is much bigger. It's not the, okay. Well, that's a bit, that's a little bit hard. But the, if you look at these other three options, it's definitely wrong. The bond dissociation energy of HX decreases. That is true. As the halides, as the halides get bigger, as you go down, the bonds get longer between hydrogen and that, and the bonds get weaker. So that is true. That is true. The polarity of the bond decreases. That is true because chlorine is a lot more electronegative than bromine, which is more electronegative than iodide. And they are more easily oxidized. That's true. It's much, well, if you've got to oxidize iodine, you've got to remove electrons from it. And it's much easier to remove electrons from iodine than it is from chlorine because it's a bigger atom. The electron that you're going to remove is further away from the nucleus and more shielding. Okay, so A is the only correct answer there. Okay. Right, what is observed when you add concentrated hydrochloric acid to an aqueous solution of copper sulfate? Right, well, you get a ligand exchange reaction here, don't you? And you form the copper, you get four, four chloride ligands, uh, and that's got a two minus charge, and that's a yellowy green color. That's all that happens there. So you don't get any gas form, no, that's wrong. No gas evolved. Uh, a precipitate forms, no, the color solution changes. You know, this, um, that is the only one which is possibly correct there. Okay, what is the most suitable free agent for detecting the presence of carbonate ions in the presence of excess sulfate ions? Okay, right, dilute NaOH is not going to react with carbonate ions, so that's no good. Dilute sulfuric acid, that will react with uh, carbonate ions to give CO2 gas. So you're going to get fizzing, effervescence. So that would be a good way of doing it. Let's see, make sure the other ones are no good. Right, adding barium chloride solution. Right, you may think that you, yeah, you would get a precipitate of barium carbonate, but you'd also get a precipitate of barium sulfate. So you wouldn't know, because you've got sulfate ions present there, you wouldn't know that you had any carbonate, you just get a white precipitate. And sodium chloride wouldn't, there'd be no reaction at all there. So B is definitely the right answer there. Methyl benzene reacts with a mixture of concentrated nitric and concentrated sulfuric acid. So yeah, you're going to form the NO2 uh, electrophile, aren't you, with that mixture, nitrating mixture. And how does that react with benzene? Well, you should know that that is you're going to nitrate the benzene. So you're going to swap it. 
you know, we've got an H plus coming off there. The NO2 is an electrophile, it's a substitution reaction, so it's electrophilic substitution. Twenty-one. A possible synthesis of a compound found in jasmine flower oil is shown below. So you've got all these steps here, which is not used in this synthesis. Okay. Right. Let's let's see what those three steps are. Right. You swapped. You've added a chlorine on there. The only way you can do that that's free radical substitution. Here you swapped a chlorine for an OH. There's a. You've got a delta. You've got a partial positive charge on that carbon, so that is a electrophilic sorry, nucleophilic substitution. And here you're forming an ester, this is nucleophilic addition followed by elimination. Now, the only one that is not there is, okay, is free, is electrophilic substitution. There's no electrophilic substitution there because you're not, you're not actually sticking anything onto the benzene ring in any of those reactions. It's all, you're all, you're just doing reactions on the side chain. So, that's a bit of a red herring there. Electrophilic substitution. The benzene is not taking a part in the reactions in, in that reaction scheme. Okay, which compound is formed when one phenyl ethanol reacts with acidified potassium dichromate? So I've drawn one phenyl ethanol there. So there's an ethanol. There's one, two carbons. You've got an OH and a phenyl group on carbon number one. Right, that's a secondary alcohol, isn't it? And so acidified potassium dichromate, you're going to oxidize that to a ketone. I'm going to replace that there. So which one is it? You can see it is this one. That is the benzene ring, the ketone, and the CH3. Oh, let's get rid of that as well. That's going to go, isn't it? Let's form that. Okay, that's the product, this oxidation of a secondary alcohol. Right, these reagents are added separately to four organic compounds, which row shows the correct observations. Okay, propen 1O, uh, you won't get effervescence with sodium hydrogen carbonate, that only reacts with, with acid, so that's wrong, so we can eliminate that one. Propenal, no visible check, that, so that's okay. Propenal, acidified potassium dichromate, you can oxidize an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid, so it would go from orange to green, so that's correct. And it's an aldehyde, isn't it? So you would react with tolerance. So B is the right answer there. Okay, let's check the other ones. Propanone, no visible change. That is correct. You wouldn't get that. You wouldn't get any visible change. You can't oxidize a, a ketone, but you don't get a positive test with tolerance with a ketone. That's wrong. Propanoic acid, yeah, you get fizzing. Uh, you wouldn't have, you can't oxidize a carboxylic acid. So that's correct, but you would not get a silver mirror. That's quite an easy question, really, that one. Okay. Right. 24. Which compound is formed by acid hydrolysis of phenyl methyl ethanoate? Okay. So I've drawn um, phenyl methyl. So ethanoate has got to have, it's got to have this group in it. Yeah. That's the ethanoate group. And here we've got phenyl uh, methyl. So it's not quite methyl ethanoate because it's got a, that would just be CH3, wouldn't it? It's phenyl methyl because you've got the benzene ring there. Okay. Now, if you hydrolyze that, what are you going to get? You are going to get a, you're going to get, well, this is going to give you ethanoic acid, isn't it? And the other bit is going to give you this alcohol here, CH2OH. So how well we got that is A is the correct answer there. Right. I think the tricky bit there was understanding what this phenyl methyl ethanoate looked like really. Okay. 25, a student is required to dry a liquid sample of pentanoic acid. Which drying agent is suitable? Okay. Now we write calcium oxide would not be suitable because that is a base. And so it's going to pentanoic acid is, a, is an acid. That's, that's no good. Calcium sulfate, that should be okay. Yeah. Potassium hydroxide is no good. That's also a base that would react with the pentanoic acid. And the potassium carbonate, well, the carbonate ions are a base, so they'd also react with it. So calcium sulfate is the only one you could use there.
26, the reaction between propanoyl chloride and benzene is an example of acylation, which is a correct representation of the mechanism of this reaction. Okay. Right, propanoyl chloride and benzene. Well, what happens there? You generate, right, you've got propanoyl chloride. You use aluminium chloride to generate the, that should be propanol, there should be another carbon on there really. Aluminium chloride to generate that. Okay, right, and so, uh, right, so that's what's gonna happen there. Now this this bit here is wrong, isn't it? Because the the uh, the the actual arrow should go the other way, yeah, to make a positive charge. So that's wrong. Um, this bit, this B is incorrect because the the electrons actually aluminium's got six electrons in outer shell. It doesn't give away electrons. A pair of electrons there go on to the aluminium, so that's wrong. Um, this is correct. C is correct because the pair of electrons come out of the benzene ring onto the electrophile and the positively charged carbon there, that's right. Um, let's see, D is incorrect because yeah, you do have that intermediate, but uh, um, that's not what happens here. You lose the hydrogen, so the, the, the curly arrow should go from the bond between the, and that goes into the ring, okay? C is the right answer there. So you need to know your um, electrophilic substitution reactions there and you also need that you need to know how an aluminium chloride catalyst works to generate you know the electrophile okay methylamine reacts with bromoethane by substitution to produce a mixture of products which okay which which compound is not a possible product of this reaction okay let's have a look at meth methylamine so you've got And we have bromoethane. So I draw like that. And what can happen is the right the you end up you get the lone pair goes onto the bromine there. Oh, sorry, goes onto the carbon. We won't worry too much about the mechanism, but you end up replacing uh, the hydrogen there with an ethyl group. You can end up replacing more than one hydrogen. You can replace that one there. And then you can form, that's the tertiary. I mean, you can then, if you like, replace the lone pair by sticking that one in and you form a quaternary amine salt. So I'll draw that on there. So you can form that. Right, can you form A? Yes, you can. That's if you just replace one of those hydrogens. Can you form B? Yeah, that's if you replace two of the hydrogens with an ethyl group. Can you form C? Yeah, that's where we replace the two hydrogens and the lone pair with ethyl groups. That's fine. But here you can't get D. You can't end up with two methyl groups attached to the nitrogen, which is what you've got there. That's not possible. So D is the right answer there. The, that's the one that you can't form. Okay, which polymer has hydrogen bonding between its chains? We've got Kevlar, polyethylene, PVC, and terylene. So, I'm, okay, let's have a look. So Kevlar is the blue thing. Can you get hydrogen bonding with Kevlar? Well, you can because you've got uh, lone pairs of electrons on the oxygen and you have got uh, this hydrogen, which is very delta positive because it attached to an electronegative nitrogen atom. So yes, you can with Kevlar. Let's just check the others. Polyethene here in green, obviously no hydrogen attached to uh, car, uh, nitrogen, oxygen or fluorine. So no hydrogen bonding possible there. Likewise with PVC, there's no hydrogen attached to ON or F. Uh, and terylene, which is a purple structure there, that's a polyester. Um, well, you do have lone pairs on the oxygens, but you don't have, again, you've got no hydrogen attached to um, ON or F, so no possibility of hydrogen bonding there. Uh, so you have to know your hydro what hydrogen bonds are, you have to know your polymers as well for that question, okay? Which structure shows part of a peptide link in a protein? Okay, so I've drawn two amino acids there, the red one and the green one here. And how do we form a peptide link? Well, we're going to lose 
these, we're going to lose the water there. That goes, so let's get rid of that. And we form a new bond. between the carbon and the nitrogen. Okay, now oh, oh, let's see uh, which shows a peptide link. Well, A is wrong, that's an ester, isn't it? That's not right. B is wrong because look, you don't end up with, it looks sort of right, but you've got two, you've got two carbon R's there, that's not right. Uh, that's an acid anhydride, C, that's not right. D, yeah, you do, you've got this bit here, haven't you? That's D. Right, DNA, linked together by hydrogen bonding, which row shows the number of hydrogen bonding between the pairs of bases. If you do biology, I'm sure that you find this pretty easy. If you don't, a bit more to remember, but you have to remember that which pairs, it's A and T will pair up and you get two hydrogen bonds between those two. And the other complementary pair are G and C and you get three hydrogen bonds between them. Right, so which one is right? Uh, right, that's wrong because you've got the wrong pair. Cytosine and thymine don't pair up. Guanine and cytosine, yet yeah, that is correct. And adenine and thymine do pair up, but you don't get three, you only get two hydrogen bonds. So that's a bit of a straightforward recall question there. Okay, structure and bonding, which is not responsible for conduction of electricity. So the ions in the sodium ions in multium sodium chloride, they do. They're the, the conduction of electricity, you've got to have movement of charged particles. Usually that's delocalized electrons, but in ionic compounds, which are melted, it's the ions themselves. They're the charged particles. So that is correct. The electrons between layers of carbon atoms, the delocalized electrons, that's correct. The bonding electrons in a metal, that's correct. What they mean by that is, of course, like, for example, sodium is 2A1. And in sodium metal, you lose the bonding electron, that one there, to form an Na plus ion, and that becomes delocalized. So that, that, that bonding electron is delocalized in a metal, so that's correct. And D, the lone pair electrons and water molecules, they don't move at all, obviously, so that is wrong. So that is D is our answer there. 32. Uh, in the UK, industrial ethanol is now produced by the direct hydration of ethene. This has largely replaced the fermentation method. Okay. Right. Which one is the most like direct hydration produces pure ethanol, pure ethanol. That is true. With fermentation, you can only make about a 15% aqueous solution of ethanol. And you have to purify it then. The direct hydration Root employs milder conditions, and it doesn't because fermentation is room temperature, whereas if you need high temperatures for that, so that's wrong. Direct hydration does not use a catalyst. It does use a catalyst. It uses a phosphoric acid catalyst. You've got to know that, really. So you react ethene with water in a phosphoric acid catalyst. Uh, the direct hydration route produces ethanol by a slower reaction. Now, it's much faster than fermentation, which takes days to occur, doesn't it, of course? So A is the answer there. Right, 33, which alkene reacts with hydrogen bromide to give 2-bromo-3-methylbutane as the major product? Okay, so that's the major product. Of course, the, if you think the, the hydrogen always goes to the carbon with the most hydrogens already. So that you're going to get a hydrogen there and the bromine there. Now, that is not 2-bromo-3-methyl. It's not that one. Right, this one is definitely not going to be right. B is definitely not going to be right because there's no branching in that molecule at all. So in actual fact, um, you're going to get a mixture of products there because those two carbons are going to be the same. There isn't really a minor product or a major product, um, but it can't be them. C... Right, you are going to get the hydrogen going there and the bromine going there. Uh, that is not 2-bromo-3-methylbutane. It's 2-bromo-2-methylbutane, I think that is. So it's got to be this one. Let's just check. So we are going to get the hydrogen going on that one there and the bromine going there. Uh, that is right. If we just number those carbons, one, 
two, three, four. Okay, and we've got a methyl coming off number three. So it's uh, two bromo, that is two bromo, three methyl. D is the right answer there. Uh, that's quite hard and, you know, spend the time drawing out those structures. Um, it's very difficult when they write the formula on a straight line there. It's usually much easier if you've got a displayed formula. So just scribble them down. Make sure you don't make mistakes. 34, which compound can be purified by forming a hot aqueous solution that recrystallizes on cooling? Right, it can't be cyclohexene. That is completely insoluble in water. It won't dissolve in water even if it's hot, yeah, because it's more van der Waals forces in hexene, cyclohexene, more hydrogen bombs in water. Ethanoic acid uh, is very soluble in water. In fact, you can make it's always miscible with water, so you can't, it won't crystallize out. So it can't be that one. You can have, you know, ethanoic acid, you can have any percentage of ethanoic acid in water. It's always soluble. Uh, phenylamine, now that is not very soluble in water at all. So it's not going to be that one. Uh, benzoic acid is the answer there. Benzoic acid, it's sparingly soluble in water, right? You've got the benzene ring, that's not going to help it dissolve in water at all because it's all van der Waals forces and so on. But you've got a carboxylic acid group which can form hydrogen bonds, so it is a bit soluble in water. So D, it's got to be the answer there. Okay, last question, 35. Use the data book to help you answer this question about which is the main aspartic acid species present in aqueous solution, right? So I think they want you the data book to show you what is aspartic acid, which is that, okay. Now, all of those things are all uh, basically the right shape for aspartic acid. There's one that's completely wrong there. Uh, yeah, they're all about right, aren't they? Um, but, right, it's pH 14. That means you are going to, there's a strong base about, okay? So, first of all, this is not going to be NH3+. plus. will not be protonated, okay? And so we can eliminate B and we can eliminate C. Also, because it's a strong base, you're gonna remove that proton and that proton. So you're gonna have a negative charge and negative charge there. So D is the correct answer there. Okay, and that is the end of that e exam. <laughs>